Hi, this is Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. Today in this video, we're going to repair and restore this vintage R Bax. So I've done a video in the past where I've run you through the features of the RBAX, but I've never done a repair or restoration video for the RBAX. It's a fairly simple synthesizer. There's not much going on inside, and there's not much to restoring it. But I thought I was about to do this one, so I thought it would be interesting to, to show you guys what's under the hood and how I go about restoring and repairing one. So I bought this RBAX as a parts or repair type unit. Um, supposedly non-functional and it, it does power on and it makes sound uh, but there are some issues uh, generally I don't like to turn on the parts and repairs type keyboards that I buy particularly ARPs because they tend to have shorted tantalum capacitors inside them so powering them up usually uh, does more harm than good before I work on them but in this case uh, it, it does turn on and makes noise and I'll show you kind of what's up with it. So uh, the first most glaring issue is no matter what key I press I'm getting the same note. The transpose works but it's the same note regardless of, of what key that's being pressed. Uh, the other issue is um, with sustain up, it sustains indefinitely. So these two issues are probably going to turn out to be something pretty simple, like a, a wire, a J wire hooked on the key bed. Um, but we're going to go through methodically and kind of uh, do a, a general restoration to it and we'll see what issues go away with that and what issues remain afterwards. Um, the clue that it's a, a wire that's stuck is if I put this on auto repeat, it's, it's doing that, um, which it should, but if I put it on keyboard repeat, it still plays a note over and over when really it should only be doing that if you've got a, a note uh, pressed down, a key pressed down. So that's one issue, or two issues. Uh, the other is that sample and hold isn't working to the VCO, but it is working to the VCF. So let's, let's do this. And we'll put it on sample and hold mode and turn sample and hold up. So we hear sample and hold going to the VCF. Let's uh, go to the VCO. And nothing's happening there. So that's issue number three. And the fourth issue is uh, we've been listening to the keyboard through the low output. If I switch over to the high output, it's actually lower than the low output. So there's four issues there that we, we know of offhand. Uh, and we'll see how many of them get repaired during the general restoration of this keyboard. So the general restoration is going to consist of three things. One is recapping the synthesizer. These ARPs use tantalum capacitors, which are known to have a high failure rate, and they fail as shorts. Uh, taking other things out with them, causing problems with functionality. So we need to get all of those out of this synthesizer. We'll also recap the electrolytic capacitors and the power supply because at this point they're over 40 years old and uh, they're not going to be performing as well as new capacitors. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to address the sliders. The sliders, um, I mean, they're, they're cool and all, but they're like magnets for dust and, and spills and other things to get in there. So um, they're always scratchy, and the signal path um, does pass through the sliders. 
So if a slider is dirty, it can actually cause things not to work. So we'll proactively address the sliders. Um, we can do this by cleaning the sliders that are there. So we, we could desolder the sliders that are there, disassemble them, clean them, put them back in. We could use uh, new reproduction sliders, um, like the kinds that I have available on my website. Or what we're going to do here is we're going to put in the uh, LED slider kit that I make. Uh, and that's basically going to go in here, replace all those sliders with new um, illuminated, smooth, modern sliders. And the third thing that we're going to do is we're going to address the key bed. So we're going to change the bushings. Right now it's kind of clacky. Uh, we're going to clean the bus bars and the key contacts and we're going to check and adjust all the wires, um, the J wires. Um, so those three things probably can solve 90 to 95 percent of the issues with the ARP axe, with a broken ARP axe. Uh, there are oftentimes failed uh, CMOS chips or op amp chips on the, uh, the board. Um, you can shotgun it and while you've got the board out doing the sliders and capacitors, just replace the chips. I have a kit available for that. Uh, or you can troubleshoot specific failures um, and replace only what's necessary. In this case, because it seems to be working pretty well, I'll leave the chips and if there's any chips that need to be changed, we'll troubleshoot them and figure it out together. So let's get inside. So I've unplugged the synthesizer. And to get in, this is a Mark II axe. Um, so to get in, we're going to remove four screws, two here to the right of the key bed and two to the left of the key bed. And we'll turn the keyboard around. And normally, there are some black screws here. Someone has replaced them with these little uh, thumb, thumb screws that we can remove. Now we can turn it around again and open it up just by lifting this front panel here up and back like this. So inside, uh, I'm not sure what this is doing here. That doesn't look kosher. Um, but inside we have the main circuit board up here and the power supply down here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark uh, these Molex connectors. They're not um, polarized, so they can be plugged in backwards. I find that just taking a little pen and making a little mark that shows which way they, they go uh, can save a lot of headache later for yourself or for other people working on the keyboard. Next we'll remove this circuit board by removing these eight screws. And there we go, we've got the circuit board out. This one is actually very clean. Usually the uh, sliders are fuzzy and hairy and totally disgusting. Um, that's why these, I, I guess, can at least move. Sometimes they're so stiff you can't even move them. Uh, but still, we're going we're gonna to go through and methodically address everything. So this is the circuit board for the ARP axe. Um, basically a bunch of sliders down here and a few IC chips and resistors and a few handful of little tandem capacitors there. But there's really not much to this. It's a single oscillator synthesizer um, with a handful of modulation options. This here is the 4075 filter. As part of um, uh, what we do, we'll pull this out and we'll change the tandem capacitors on this and while we have it out, we'll correct the uh, cutoff frequency design error uh, that they made. Um, normally, if it was a synthesizer that I hadn't powered up and tested, I would put this uh, filter module into my test fixture and test the filter, but I've already tested it you know, via the synthesizer and it's working, so I'm not going to need to troubleshoot anything on the filter module. 
In the back here we've got a little power supply. Uh, usually to get it out you uh, unscrew it from the bottom, but it looks here like there's some screws on the top. Uh, so we'll take it out that way. And there are some wires that connect it to the mains wire and power switch. Obviously, um, do not touch this area if the synthesizer is not completely unplugged. Uh, you will do grievous bodily harm to yourself if you uh, do what I'm doing when the synthesizer is plugged in. So that's the synthesizer's um, power supply is disconnected from the mains wiring now and I'll unscrew and remove the power supply. Here's the power supply removed. It's a simple linear power supply that puts out plus and minus 15 volts. So the AC uh, power comes in here. There's a fuse. Uh, your transformer, which drops the voltage down. You've got two filter capacitors, two large filter capacitors. And the power supply is based on the 723IC, which is out of production now. And uh, it uses uh, two pass transistors, one for the plus 15 volt rail, one for the minus 15 volt rail. There's a trimmer here that you can adjust the plus 15 volts, and a trimmer to adjust the minus 15 volts. And a couple of little bypass capacitors on the output there. Um, so what we're going to do on this power supply is we're going to uh, change these four capacitors, uh, test our work, and then uh, move on to the rest of the synthesizer. Before we install our new capacitors, we can check real quick to uh, confirm that all four of the diodes in the bridge rectifier are uh, functioning correctly. They're not shorted or open. Um, just run through it real quick. If you're really paranoid, you can go in the other direction to confirm that it's not conducting. And they're all fine. And generally, I don't find problems with the bridge diodes in ARP synthesizers. So what I've got here is I've got a, uh, a power cord, and I've wired it up with hot going to the, uh, the third terminal there the one that would be the uh, hot after the switch when it's installed in the synthesizer, and the neutral going on the neutral there. So this is very dangerous to be touching in that area. Um, you don't want to forget that you've got this thing plugged in. Uh, it could be bad news. So don't do it this way. Install it back in the synthesizer. Test it safely. Do as I say, not as I do. Uh, but I've got it powered on now, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my meter and I'm going to stuff the black lead down in the center and the uh, red lead on the red wire and uh, if I get them in there right now I'm reading 15.16 volts and we don't need to calibrate this now uh, we just want to make sure that it's working and uh, and you know um, so we don't damage anything when we connect it to the rest of the synthesizer so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do back it off now uh, I'm going to back it off down to 15 volts or a little under 15 volts. Again, we'll calibrate it once it's installed in the synthesizer and connected to a load. Calibrating it now does no good. You just want to, again, prevent yourself from exposing stuff to over voltage when you plug it back in. So now I'll move the red lead over to the purple wire and the uh, negative 15 volts is sitting at negative 14.82, which is fine. I uh, just want to make sure it's 15 or less. Uh, it'll go down even more once it's connected to a load. Um, but uh, that's, that power supply seems to be good. Um, once we uh, connect it to a load, we can uh, just slap a scope on the different power rails, make sure there's not excessive noise or any, any other issues coming from the power supply. Um, and uh, that's that. So here on the main board of the axe, what we're going to start uh, by doing is removing the components that we're going to be replacing. Uh, all the sliders we're going to are going to take off. Uh, the tantalum capacitors, you can see one here, 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 two here, and one over here. We're going to remove those. Um, and uh, I mentioned that 
you can shotgun um, a repair by re replacing the IC chips um, while you're while you're doing this. Uh, I use the term shotgun, uh, which sometimes has a negative connotation, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with replacing the chips while you're in here doing this. I mean, um, if it can save you the time and expense and the long wait of bringing your synthesizer to a technician, having them sit on it for weeks, months, years, or whatever, just to wind up replacing these exact same chips, why not just go ahead and do it? There's one, two, three. This transistor array uh, isn't included in my kit, and generally I don't recommend replacing it unless you know you need to, but there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine chips that you'd replace with the with the kit that I have available and you know if it takes it if it if it solves your problem there's there's nothing wrong with just doing it that way there's no law that says you have to troubleshoot with a scope and find out exactly what's wrong and change only that part the the downside is if you're not careful with your soldering skills um, these art boards are fairly easy to damage so you could wind up doing more harm than, than good but uh, even though I said it was, you could do a shotgun by uh, changing out all the chips, there's, there's nothing wrong with that, particularly if it's your synthesizer. I mean, if it's yours, you know, by all means, you should be repairing it yourself instead of spending tons of money on a, on a technician. So to get the sliders out, we're going to turn the board over. And there are some tabs here that uh, come from the factory twisted. Uh, someone must have taken this one out at some point because they're not twisted, but this one next to it is twisted. And what we'll do is we'll use a pair of flat nose pliers like this, and we'll give it a squeeze and straighten out the tab. Sometimes after you untwist them, there's a little bit of the metal that's uh, sticking out like that, and you can just cut that off with a wire cutter. Also, you'll desolder the two pins for each slider, and there's a number of them, so just go down the row and bang them all out. Um, and then I'll show you how to remove them without damaging them in case you want to refurbish them yourself. To remove these sliders without uh, damaging them so they can be reinstalled later, what we'll do is we'll use the flat nose plier again, and we'll grip those tabs, and we'll shove the tab through the hole in the PCB. And we'll do the same on the bottom. And then the slider just, just comes free and drops out like that. If you try to pull the slider out from the top, you may wind up damaging the plastic housing or the retaining clip. So it's easier um, and safer just to push it through from the bottom like I just showed you. Here are the old sliders removed. Um, at this point, if you were going to refurbish them, you could take the retaining clips off, open them up and clean them out really well, or lubricate them and reassemble them. Uh, I find that it just it takes so long, it's so labor intensive that it's just more economical to replace them with new sliders, either the reproduction ones or the uh, LED illuminated sliders. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these and I'm going to put them in my bin of other ARP sliders. Now that I have the sliders off, I'm going to do a little bit of cleaning. Uh, I'm not sure that, that you can see. Yeah, there you can see at this angle. Um, you can see the grime that entered in the slider openings and deposited itself on the circuit board uh, in between the sliders. It's kind of clean there where the slider was sitting. You can see some spills had made it through. Um, this this particular ARP was in a road case, so it didn't get that much dust. Usually it's a lot worse than this. Um, but we'll clean this. Um, I'm just going to clean it with a rag and some alcohol. Uh, if it were worse, this would be a good candidate for a board to wash in the sink, like I showed in my one of my previous videos. Also, on the back side, um, there is a rosin core flux residues left from when the ARP uh, soldered the sliders originally at the factory and we're going to clean all that flux residue off and get the board nice and clean. Flux residues like this um, they tend not to cause any problem but you can see that the flux uh, basically is bridging these two traces 
and uh, in theory it could cause a uh, high impedance path where you don't intend for there to be one. So it's always a good practice to clean flux residues. To avoid messes like this that you'll have to clean up when you're done soldering, uh, you can use a solder with a uh, no clean flux core instead of a rosin core solder. So I got it nice and clean on the back and the front. So the next step is to remove the tantalum capacitors and I'll take out the filter submodule at this time as well. And you don't want to cut the pins and you don't want to allow these uh, parts that are sticking off the back to break because you'll want to clip your scope on them to calibrate or troubleshoot the synthesizer. So I've got the uh, old capacitors removed and some resistors from the filter module. So I'm going to correct the uh, cutoff frequency limitation on that. Uh, so this is the filter module. Uh, once it's removed, um, I have taken out uh, the capacitors and a few resistors. Uh, there's a Tempco resistor here. This is the, uh, there's a bunch of uh, thermally coupled transistor pairs. This one's for the exponential converter. That's an LM3900 Norton op amp. That's the basis of this four-pole filter. Um, I would, uh, unless you're very, very adept with the soldering iron, particularly the desoldering portion of it, um, I would uh, think twice about messing with this guy. The uh, traces on the back side, um, they're not protected by any solder mask. Um, you know, it's a very thin traces on single-sided on a board. Um, Usually when um, I work on one of these that someone has already been working on, um, I find uh, the traces and pads lifted. So it's, it's very easy to damage. So use as little heat as possible. Um, but um, yeah, the goal is to get out the tantalum capacitors and uh, correct the cutoff frequency there. And speaking about tantalum capacitors, uh, I know there's going to be that guy uh, who's going to be in the comments, uh, you know, uh, talking about tantalum capacitors. I do not have a beef with tantalum capacitors. Uh, my issue is with these particular tantalum capacitors. I've done hundreds of ARP synthesizers, and the types of, the, the, the particular tantalum capacitors that they used in these synthesizers are highly failure prone. Um, not they don't need to be exposed to over voltage to short out. Uh, they develop internal defects and short out on their own. And they just all need to be replaced. Um, you can replace them with tantalum. You can replace them with electrolytic. You can replace them with whatever you want. But do yourself a favor and get them out of your synthesizer. And uh, one last thing I'm going to do before I start installing the new parts is I'm going to clean these switches. We've got the octave switch which is uh, under here. We've got the sample and hold switch and the uh, repeat switch. And I'm also going to clean this uh, tuning pot, both the outside and the, the uh, inside. So with the uh, power supply and the main circuit board done, the next thing I turn my attention to is the key bed. Uh, I'll show you how to get the key bed out of the ARP axe and we'll have a look underneath. Uh, but the process for refurbishing the key bed is the same as I've shown in, in numerous other videos. Um, so uh, we'll skip over that in this one. To get the key bed out, it's easiest to do like on a keyboard stand. Uh, there are um, three screws along the front of the key bed. You can see one of them there. And two screws in the back. Uh, you can see one of them there. So we'll take those out. So I've got my very fashionable towel laid down here, and I've got those five screws removed, so the key bed will just lift up and out, and I can turn it over like this. So what I can see right off the bat, um, well, let's ignore this alligator clip thing for a second. What I can see right off the bat is this low C. Um, Kind of hard to see here, but this uh, this later style of key uh, had these little flimsy plastic uh, rods that these little things are attached to, and this one broke off. So the uh, both the uh, CV and the uh, the uh, the gate um, J wires are touching the bus bars. 
So the synthesizer is o is thinking that the uh, that the low C is always being pressed. So we're going to have to repair or replace this key, uh, and then this wire won't be won't be sitting there permanently touched on on those bus bars, and that should resolve two of the uh, the issues that we saw when we first turned it on. Over here, I'll zoom out a little bit. We see that um, someone previously working on it. Um, must have damaged. I'll unclip this. Unclip this. There's a there's a little connector there that connects these wires that go to the wire harness to the bus bars, and someone must have uh, must have damaged that little connector and rigged their own up with an alligator clip. Uh, this is what we call the synth MacGyver. It tries to fix the synthesizers with chewing gum and paper clips. One more thing in case it helps someone. Uh, like I said, I have a damaged key here that I'm gonna try to repair, but I may need to replace. Um, these keys look a little different than the other Pratt and Reed key keys that we're used to seeing. Uh, usually we see a little metal lever coming out here, and instead of sitting in between these notches, like these are, uh, they the little metal lever little goes uh, goes in like that. Um, so so you'd think that you'd need to replace this with the same kind of key, but you actually don't. These uh, keys that you probably have more of on hand or can more easily obtain will work on this key bed. And you can mix and match them with this style of key. And once it's closed up, the synthesizer's closed up, you'll never tell the difference. Well, part of the synth MacGyver's legacy will live on in this keyboard. Um, so what it was, uh, was just what I thought, the, uh, the little connector here that, that goes, connects the wire to the bus bar, it slips on and off, it, it broke, and it's, it's common. These are, these are really lousy connectors to begin with. Uh, so what this person did was the, uh, they, they clipped one end of an alligator wire onto it, wrapped it in electrical tape, and then the other end of the alligator wire was clipped on to the bus bar. So I, I, I kind of cleaned it up a little bit, and I just took a tiny little bit of the alligator wire, the, the alligator clip wire. I soldered it onto the existing wire, I put some heat shrink on it, and now, now it can clip there onto the bus bar. And... Uh, it doesn't look as cheesy as before. Uh, you know, it, there would be nothing wrong with just soldering this wire directly to the bus bar. It wouldn't reach, so you'd have to extend it. But uh, in, in other ARP synthesizers, um, the, uh, the wires uh, are soldered directly to the bus bars. And in fact, to remove the bus bar, uh, you need to uh, desolder this side. Anyway, so... Um, yeah, there, there, there are a number of different solutions to this. This is how I did it. Um, I guess I uh, could have also found this connector and uh, put a new one of those on. But like I said, they're not very good to begin with. You can see how, how oxidized that is. It doesn't look like shiny metal anymore. Um, so it's just not very good to begin with. Also, to show you that broken key, so this is what the what a one of these style keys looks like. So this is the little shaft that, uh, that connects to the uh, little plastic thingy down here that, that guides the uh, the wires into the bus bar. Nice technical terms, thingies and stuff like that. But anyway, uh, on the older style that you may be more familiar with, that's metal. Um, this whole thing is plastic, so this is uh, fragile and often breaks. So here's the, the one that broke. I'm going to try to reattach the little piece that broke off. And if not, we can always just replace it with a uh, newer, uh, or sorry, an older style key. And one of the other issues that I had uh, mentioned was that the uh, high and the low jacks seem to be reversed. So this one this is the pedal jack, this is the low output, this is the high output, and this is the external audio input, and they come up this connector here. So uh, it looks like someone replaced these quarter-inch jacks at some point, 
and you can see here the wire coming from the uh, circuit board of the synthesizer is going into this one, which is the low, and then there's a uh, resistor, which is basically a voltage divider, dropping the level down, uh, making the high actually the low. And, and I don't know, that, that low seemed very low, so I don't know if this value of resistor is correct. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to switch this uh, back so the the one labeled high is actually high and the one labeled low is actually low. And I'm going to uh, check the values of these resistors and and make sure that that whoever did this put the right the right thing there. Since again that low seemed a little bit too low. So I've got the LED sliders installed. I don't have them hooked up to power yet. Um, there's a little auxiliary power supply that I'll install in the bottom of the case. Um, once I button everything up, that uh, drives the LEDs. Um, I don't want to run all of these LEDs off the 15-volt uh, power supply of the synthesizer. It's a, it's a bit much current draw with 20-something LEDs, and um, uh, since it's at 15 volts, um, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, power wasted in the form of heat. Um, so anyway, uh, I have it right now with the circuit board uh, plugged in, so the, all the wires from the wiring harness are plugged in on the back. So I can test the synthesizer. I've got a little piece of cardboard here so it doesn't scratch up the keys. Um, and this way I can, um, you know, see the components. I can probe things with my scope if necessary. I have access to all the trimmers for calibrating it. Uh, so basically at this point I'd go through and i test everything, make sure it's working. Uh, we had four issues. Um, we had uh, the uh, one note was uh, it was always the same note that was playing regardless of what key, and we saw that that was due to a uh, a damaged key there. Also, the sustain uh, was never releasing, uh, also due to the damaged key. So now, so now those two issues are resolved. Uh, there was the issue of the uh, uh, high and low being switched, and it was just that the jacks were, were switched. The values of the resistors that they had there were correct. So the jacks were a little jacked up, and I just switched them. Um, so now the high is, is high and the low is low. Uh, and then the sample and hold wasn't working before, but only to the oscillator. So we'll turn the sample and hold switch up. And uh, this one here is sample and hold for oscillators. So that's working now. So it was probably the slider. It could have been the switch. I cleaned the switch a little, but I didn't really do any invasive kind of cleaning or heavy-duty cleaning to the switch. So it probably was just the slider that was bad. So. Uh, just by going through and addressing the sliders, capacitors, and key bed, we resolved, and a little visual inspection type stuff, we resolved all the issues that we were having with this before, and at the same time, we've done a comprehensive service on it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to calibrate the synthesizer, so I'm going to uh, uh, tune and scale the uh, oscillators, the oscillator, uh, I'm going to calibrate the filter um, so it scales correctly and starts in, at the roughly the correct cutoff frequency. Uh, and then to calibrate the VCA, uh, just so there's no thump when you press a key. It doesn't sound like there is right now, but we'll uh, make sure that we have the optimal VCA calibration there per the service manual. Uh, and then once I'm done with that, uh, provided there's no issues, that are exposed during calibration. Uh, we'll put this board back on the panel, install the auxiliary power supply for the LED sliders, and show you the finished product. I didn't run into any issues while I was calibrating it, uh, so everything was working great. Uh, I installed the power supply for the LED sliders and buttoned things up. I added these uh, um, slider caps that have a little window that the light can shine through. So when the synthesizer's on, you can see the illumination, and if you turn it off, uh, it looks pretty close to the original, um, you know, with the slider caps. So if someone didn't like the illuminated sliders, they could just cut the power to the sliders, 
and be able to take advantage of the nice, smooth, new, modern sliders with caps and a, a pretty similar look to the original. Um, of course, if you like the illumination, there it is. I replaced the, uh, the shiny silver-colored screws with black screws, both here and along the back. So uh, things look nice and neat. And the synthesizer is done and ready to find a new home. So we just saw that it didn't take much in terms of time or parts to get this Arp Axe working uh, and looking great. Uh, with these older Arps in particular, it just pays to be methodical and address the things that you know need to be repaired. The tantalum capacitors, the sliders, the key bed, and then uh, if you so choose while you're in there to take care of the op amps and CMOS IC chips that are tend to tend to fail. In this case there were none that, that had failed. Um, but uh, you could bang those out while you're in there and that will take care of 90 to 95 percent of the issues that you'll find with these uh, with these ARPs. This is definitely something that the average person could do themselves at home. So hopefully this video uh, gave someone out there uh, some insight or confidence to be able to tackle their ARP axe. Uh, if not, hopefully it was just an interesting look inside the ARP axe and what goes into restoring it. This has been Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Synth Chaser.